how we do this, we are the truest, got these fangs super sharp, your shit toothless, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish, in the graveyard, acting foolish, finna dance with the devil to no music, cold hearted, yeah we ruthless, all the ghouls in the cut, let's get ghoulish. Ghoulish Books presents Maggot Screaming by Max Booth III, narrated by John Wayne Comunali. Part 4. Skeletonization a couple years ago, before the big divorce, before the great decomposing, the three of us went out for dinner somewhere. I forgot where. Probably that Italian place next to the comic book shop, if I had to guess. Where we ate isn't relevant to the story. What's important is afterward we stopped at Walgreens. I don't remember what we needed. Cigarettes, probably. All three of us got out of the car, but only one of us remained biologically connected to the car. I'm pretty sure if someone is given enough time on Earth, they will eventually slam their finger in a car door, which is what happened to me that night. The door swallowed the entirety of my thumb. It didn't bounce back like you'd expect it to do after connecting with a human finger. Instead, the door came to a close, clicking in place and everything, followed by the sound of my dad pressing the automatic lock button on his car keys. The pain was instantaneous. I tried pulling away and nothing gave. I tried opening the door already knowing it was locked and nothing opened. So what other choice did I have but to scream? So I screamed and screamed and screamed. And my parents panicked. It took them what felt like at least two full minutes to figure out what was happening to me and then another minute to remember the car was locked. By the time my hand was free again, I no longer had a thumbnail. It had been ripped clean off, leaving behind a layer of mucus-textured blood matching the same dimensions as the exiled nail. I tried to scream again, but no sound emitted from my mouth. Dad dragged me into Walgreens in search of bandages. Blood dripped off my finger and left a trail on the marble floor of the medical supplies aisle. The ability to cry returned while standing at the checkout register. The noise coming out of me was so piercing, I remember the cashier pressing both hands against her ears and grimacing. The nail grew back over the course of several months, but not the way it used to look. It was different. It formed with a deep ridge along the center, resembling something like the half pipes at skateboard parks. A couple years later, it still hadn't smoothed out. It always grew wrong. It was corrupt. And I couldn't stop thinking about that. How sometimes when you lose something, even if it grows back, it never really returns the way you remember it. Sometimes things change, and there's nothing you or I or anybody can do to make them go back to how they used to be. Things started getting weird after Andy died. Well, weirder than they already were. Dad forbade me from setting foot in the yard. The kitchen table was dragged across the room and placed in front of the door to prevent me from exiting. He told me Andy had decided to go home, that he no longer wanted anything to do with us, that we were alone again. What about Comrade? I asked. He said we can keep her, Dad replied. You know, for good luck. But what about his truck? It's still out front. Wouldn't you know it? He gave that to us too. I didn't believe a single word of what he was saying. Andy loved only two things in this world, and both of them were on our property. He never would have given them to us, not as gifts, not as anything. As far as I'd been able to gather over the weekend, he hardly liked my father that much anymore. Could they still be considered friends? Maybe so. Otherwise, Andy would have never come out here on Friday night when we needed him the most. But good friends? 
Once upon a time, yeah, totally. Before everything that happened between them and Miguel and Mom. Now, though, there was something present in their friendship. But it wasn't as strong as it used to be, and it certainly wasn't at the sort of level where it'd make sense for him to randomly give us his dog and truck. I don't think their friendship had ever reached that stage. Plus, I heard the noises outside, the screaming, the hedge trimmer, the silence. If Dad didn't want to tell me what he'd done, then fine. He could keep it as his little secret. Maybe he was too ashamed to admit the truth, and maybe I was too afraid to fully embrace the idea that my father had murdered another human being with a hedge trimmer. Neither of us spoke about the kitchen table he pushed in front of the door. After all, if Andy had gone home, then what was Dad preventing me from seeing? After she finished gnawing on my dismembered arm, Comrade camped out beneath the table, scratching at the door, as if she somehow knew what happened. And maybe she did know. Dogs are smart. They pick up on things. They sense when a new danger's in the air. They worry. Dad and I ignored her best we could, which was easier for Dad than it was for me. Dad had other things to obsess over. There was no room in his mental energy to stress out about a dog concerned for her master. I have a theory, Dad said not too long after forbidding me from the backyard. We were in the living room, sharing the love seat again, watching The Simpsons with the volume on low. Dead Dad and Dead Mom still leaned against each other on the couch. You sat on the carpet, next to your parents' legs, one hand brushing against the Ouija board. Were you clutching it? Like the board game was a personal possession? Maybe that was my brain melting into jelly. Something I've learned is that, while decomposing into nothing, it's often difficult to separate fantasy from reality. As chemicals break down and organs liquefy, something in your mind snaps, and the definition of rationality is the first to rot. The reason for this is simple. There is no difference between fantasy or reality. The things we perceive as unreal are only disregarded as such because we don't know how to properly process what we're seeing without going insane. Fortunately, one of the many benefits of decomposition is embracing total madness. Back to Dad's theory, which he was about to explain. What was it that body farm psycho was saying about saints? Saints? I said the word, not making any sense in my head. They're incorruptible, Dad said. Remember what she said back on her golf cart? Sometimes when a dead body doesn't decompose right away, that might mean the body belonged to a saint. I thought she said religious people made that up. But what if they were right? Dad asked. What if there are saints, and what if they really are incorruptible? I tried to consider his question, then realized I needed several questions of my own answered first, like, what does being a saint mean? What are you talking about? Was Dad's response. I don't know what saints are. Of course you do. I do? They're like religious superheroes or something, like celebrities in heaven, uh, holy people who never sinned or whatever the hell. What do they do? What do you mean, what do they do? Are they guards? Do they patrol things in heaven? What do saints have to do? They don't have to do anything. They're saints. Are they guardian angels? Guardian angels don't exist, Dad said with confidence. But saints do? I don't know, Dylan. I'm speculating. Are we saints? I pointed at you and your parents. Are they saints? What? Dad sounded disgusted. Why would they be saints? They were dead first. Who's to say they were ever alive in the first place? which was a question neither of us had posed before. Before we found you in the garden grave, had there been a time when you weren't dead? If someone is never actually alive, can they be classified as dead? Or are they something else? Have you ever sinned? I asked. Sinned? You said saints never have... I know what I said. Well, have you? I don't know, Dad said. If I have, it's not like they were big sins or anything. What's a big sin? I asked, thinking about why the kitchen door was suddenly blocked off. Murder? Listen, 
I don't know if we're saints, okay? It was just a fucking theory. So why don't you get off my case? I'm sorry, I said. Jesus Christ, it's like I'm talking to your mother. Do you think she's... No, he said, cutting me off. I don't think she's any more okay than we are. I think she's very much not okay, actually. Oh, I'm sorry to break the news to you, kid, but we're pretty much fucked. Can we go see her? Where, in Corpus? Yeah, I don't know, he said after a while. Maybe later. Dad turned up the TV and we watched The Simpsons without continuing the conversation. He didn't bring up Saints again, and I stopped asking if he thought my mom was going to be okay. We ran out of Simpsons episodes to watch, so Dad suggested we pass the time by playing video games. I reminded him that I only had one arm thanks to Comrade. He asked me, so what? I said, so how am I supposed to use a controller? He shrugged like I was trying to create an excuse not to play. Just use your stub, he said. You only need it to guide the left joystick, right? Most of the action comes from the other hand anyway. I couldn't argue with that. It sure beat having to think too hard about our current situation. Well, that's what I assumed anyway, until Dad inserted the disc for Zombies Ate My Neighbors into our PlayStation 4. Something about playing a game featuring the undead felt wrong. Like, We were belittling ourselves. When I voiced this concern, Dad dismissed me with a scoff and said, We ain't zombies, goddammit. Grab your controller. Then what are we? I asked, retrieving the second player controller for the system. What are we? Dad said, like he didn't understand the question. You're my son, and I'm your dad. That's what the heck we are. Zombies Ate My Neighbors wasn't a game I'd ever heard of until Dad introduced me to it a couple months after the divorce finalized. Probably the first weekend where he seemed to be in a genuine good mood. Before then, whenever it was his turn to have me, our time together was usually spent with me watching him get drunk and bawl his eyes out. Don't get me wrong, those intoxicated crying sessions never officially stopped. But they did start occurring less frequently the day his online order of Zombies Ate My Neighbors arrived. When he first told me the title, I asked him what he was talking about, convinced he'd gotten it mixed up with some other game. It wouldn't have been the first time. Memories of him accidentally muttering Fortcraft and Farm Birds were constant jokes in our family. Before, well, before so it didn't seem too far outside the realm of reality that Zombies Ate My Neighbors was another unique butchering of several different popular games. Turned out to be a game from his childhood, which automatically made me suspicious of it for being any good. No offense to him, but in my experience, most of the video games from when Dad was my age are pretty boring, especially compared to newer games. So imagine my surprise when Zombies Ate My Neighbors ended up kicking ass. He ordered it from a retro gaming company that re-released both Zombies and its inferior sequel, Ghoul Patrol, together in one package. The weekend it arrived, we played it in co-op mode for the first time, fell in love, then every other weekend afterward we tried to play it again at least once. This was over a year ago, and we still hadn't managed to beat it. The game was sometimes frustratingly difficult, and also a little stupid due to its lack of save options. If you lost all your lives or turned the game off, you had to start at level 1 again. I watched a couple videos on YouTube of people managing to reach the end, but I was convinced they'd cheated somehow. There was no way they'd pulled that off on skill alone. The premise of Zombies Ate My Neighbors is not complicated. You have the choice of two characters, both of them kids around my age, Zeke or Julie, their brother and sister, or maybe their best friends. It's never explained too well. Zeke wears weird 3D glasses for reasons I've never been able to understand. Julie wears a baseball hat and a white tank top that makes me feel uncomfortable whenever I stare for too long. Somehow, they are the only ones capable of fighting the numerous monsters destroying the world. Zombies. Yes, but as you progress into higher levels, you start encountering all kinds of cool creatures, such as vampires, 
Relentless chainsaw-wielding maniacs, mummies, evil dolls, lizard men, blobs, giant ants, and 40 feet tall babies. It's up to the player to save as many terrified neighbors as possible before they get eaten up. You begin in a standard suburban neighborhood and work your way through pyramids, and grocery stores, spooky castles, and so on, utilizing a variety of creative weapons like oozy water guns, bazookas, weed whackers, explosive soda cans, ice pops, tomatoes, silverware, dishes, crucifixes, flamethrowers, fire extinguishers, and Martian bubble guns. While playing the game this time, after our Simpsons marathon, it was the weed whacker that captured my attention the most. In the game, its primary function is to destroy toxic alien fungi spreading throughout the neighborhoods. Anytime one of us operated it, I couldn't help but be reminded of the hedge trimmer we'd left in our backyard. The one I'd used to destroy Mom's garden. The one Dad had used to silence Andy. While playing the game, I kept losing focus as I wondered what the hedge trimmer might have looked like if the blade was covered in blood or if Dad had thought to wipe it off before coming inside. That was one reason I kept dying. The other was it's a lot harder to maneuver a joystick using a stump than Dad made it out to be. Maybe if I had an actual stump with a closed end, things would have been different. But I didn't have that. My wound never healed. Never even thought about healing. Instead, it remained wide open, drier than it was wet, bits of gnawed flesh dangling out of me like those flaps you drive through at a car wash. Rather than simply guide the joystick with a properly healed stump, the only way I could move it involved pressing my arm down until the joystick popped into my wound, essentially merging us together. I like to think the few maggots lingering in that specific area helped a little too, clutching onto the joystick with their tiny maggot hands. No, I thought, not a joystick. A joy stump. Hey, Dad said after I died for the seventh time in a row. What's the matter with you? You trying to lose on purpose? I'm sorry. It's okay. It's just I can't save all these neighbors by myself. Not without your help. I'll try harder. Atta boy. But it was Dad who died next. A couple levels later when we encountered a series of monsters both of us had evidently forgotten. In addition to the creatures I'd previously mentioned, zombies, vampires, kaiju babies, etc., there was one other one I should have probably included. They emerged from plants sporting an identical resemblance to our two characters. Pod people. Clones. Evil lookalikes. Dad paused. Not the game, but his movement. Let his character stand there in the middle of the neighborhood while a dozen alien doppelgangers ganged up and gleefully slaughtered him. My own character didn't fare much better either. Instead of restarting, he switched off the PlayStation 4 and said, Okay, that does it. That does what? I asked. I can't. He jabbed a thumb toward his own lookalike sitting on the other side of the living room. I can't be around this... this thing anymore. Without saying another word, he got up from the love seat and stomped toward the couch. I almost expected dead dad to flinch or try to retreat, but he remained motionless as living dad retrieved the sheet from the carpet and threw it over him. Part of me was tempted to cut out eye holes on the sheet to make him look like a ghost, but I don't think my father would have appreciated that under the circumstances. Some other time, he would have found it hilarious, I'm sure. What do you want to do with yours? He asked. With my... what? Your... your thing. It can't stay like this. I can cover it up or we can move it. You decide. Can we move him? Move him where? My room? Okay, Dad nodded. But after this, that's where it's staying. I'm not moving it again. Him. What? Him, not it. Dylan, they aren't real people. We don't know that. I thought he was going to continue arguing. But he sighed and said, You're gonna need to help me. I'm not as strong as I was last time we carried these fuckers. I couldn't offer much support with only the one arm, but I tried my best. Dad took each of your wrists and I grabbed one of your ankles. And slowly, awkwardly, we dragged you down the hall into my room. He tried to leave you near the doorway, 
but I stopped him and asked if we could lift you into my bed. That's disgusting, he said. He's been on the floor since the Ouija board, I said. Don't you think that's long enough? It's your bed. What do I care? Together, we managed to pick you up and drop you on my mattress. The springs beneath clashed at the new weight, then settled as your head lulled to the side, motionless. Afterward, he said, Okay, next you're going to help me move the other one to my room. I thought you already covered him with the sheet. Not that one, he said, and I swear I could hear the shame in his voice. It took significantly longer, but over the next hour or so, we managed to transport dead mom from the couch to dad's bed. He didn't act disgusted by the idea of her corpse rotting in his sheets like he'd been when I wanted to put you in my bed. Maybe he'd come around on the idea. Or maybe it felt different to him since he used to be married to her. Well, a version of her. What are we going to do? I asked once she was tucked under his blanket. We stood over her, not panting exactly, since we weren't capable of being out of breath anymore, but still feeling weighed down from the exercise. I think I'm going to lay down for a bit. You can sleep? No, I don't know. I don't think so. He rubbed his dried out eyes. By then, we'd both given up on moisturizing them with artificial tears. I just want to lay down and be alone. I tried looking at dead mom in bed, but he stepped around me and blocked my path. You can entertain yourself for a while, can't you? I, I guess so. Minus a couple bathroom breaks, we hadn't been separated since he picked me up Friday morning. Suddenly, the thought of us not being together felt terrifying. I didn't want to be alone, not in this house, not while we were rotten, decomposing together. It somehow seemed manageable, but alone, no way, impossible. Maybe later tonight we'll play some dice or something, he said, and closed the door. I remained standing on the other side, listening against the wood as the mattress adjusted against Dad's weight. A moment later, I heard him whisper, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I love you. I love you so much. What do I do? What the fuck do I do? I decided maybe it was best we had some alone time after all. I went to my room and shut the door. You hadn't moved since we left you here. Of course you hadn't. Against everything I had witnessed since digging up the garden grave, I was convinced you were capable of doing more than just lying still, that maybe you could get up and walk around when nobody else was watching. Toy Story logic. I sat on the edge of the bed and said, Well, now what? And you stared back at me, stubborn as ever. Should we go outside and ask a neighbor to call the police? Tell them we're rotten and my dad's gone crazy? That he's killed his friend and left his body outside? You didn't seem to agree or disagree with this plan. But what would happen then? I asked. Would I get taken away? Would they take me to my mom? Did she also go crazy? Am I crazy? What does going crazy feel like? I paused, then let out a dry laugh. <laughs> I guess talking to a dead version of myself is pretty crazy. But it didn't feel that way. Talking to you felt like the most natural thing in the world which maybe is another sign that I was, and still very much am, crazy as hell. The longer I think about it, the more I'm convinced that it doesn't matter. Reality is whatever our individual brains perceive it to be. Sometimes the details line up with the others, and sometimes they take a different path. In the end, they're all heading for the same finish line anyway. So what did it matter that I spent the rest of the day in my room talking to you? Would it have been considered more normal to tell these things to a neighbor or a cop? Nobody would have listened like you listen. They would have waited for me to let something incriminate and slip out of my mouth, then try to arrest my dad and throw me in some orphanage for the dead. But you don't judge me. You just listen. And sometimes that's all a person needs. I only wish I could do the same for you. I didn't fall asleep exactly but I came about as close to it as someone with my condition can. I daydreamed. I zoned out. I forgot where I was and why I was there. I got lost in my thoughts. What was I thinking about? 
It's hard to remember. I think it was something about Corpus Christi. Fantasizing about what my life would be like if I'd chosen to go with Mom and Miguel instead of sticking around with Dad. Would he have dug up the garden? And if he hadn't, would all this crap still happen? Something told me no. Life would be normal if we'd left the bodies in the ground. If we hadn't destroyed Mom's plants. If things had stayed the way they were and you had remained undisturbed. I could have gone to Corpus and went boogie boarding in the Gulf. We'd planned on visiting the aquarium too, which meant I could have seen real sharks if I'd have gone with them. If Dad had controlled his temper, if Mom hadn't tried being sneaky about it, if, if, if. Something loud banged above the house, followed by footsteps, followed by Comrade barking. I snapped out of whatever daze I'd fallen into and glanced down at you, still next to me in bed, as if to receive confirmation that you had also heard the noise. You didn't look like you'd noticed anything. More banging above the house. Something was definitely happening. I rolled out of bed, slowly, my atrophy and muscles trying their best to function. It was amazing I could move at all, to be honest. But then, I was more skeleton than flesh. A large chunk of my cheek under my left eye had lost all of its skin. When I touched the area, I felt smooth bone. Similar areas could be found all over my body. Under my shirt, most of my ribs had managed to poke through what remained in my belly and revealed themselves for everybody to see. The more I thought about it, the more I couldn't keep still, so I tried not to think about it at all, which only resulted in me getting obsessed with the imagery. People weren't supposed to see their own skeletons. That was the deal humans made with life. We lugged around these bones from birth until death, and as reward, we never had to come face to face with the secret truth hidden inside us all. But the longer we rotted, the clearer it became that somehow the pact had gotten broken, somewhere down the line. Now it was a free-for-all. Skeletons gone wild. At the end of the hallway, the door to our attic was extended down to the carpet like a giant wooden tongue. Comrades circled the bottom of it, barking at the sudden noises. She was outraged at this new disturbance. I peered up into the darkness and listened to the awkward footsteps above. Dad, is that you? The footsteps paused. His face appeared at the opening. The skin on his right cheek had deteriorated, revealing the dirty white of his skull. Dylan, my God, I forgot you was here. What are you doing up there? I'm trying to find something. Find what? Uh, it's none of your concern. Do you need any help? He shook his head. No, go on back to sleep. Everything's okay. Sleep? Dad, I can't. Wait! His expression morphed into a grotesque eureka. I remember which box it's in. He disappeared into the darkness again. More frantic footsteps, followed by the sound of several boxes being pushed and scavenged. I knew it, he shouted from the attic. I goddamn knew it. When he returned to the opening, he was holding something large and white, a dress of some kind, zipped in a plastic protective case. He told me to catch and dropped it into the hallway. It hit my head and fell to the floor. Dad didn't notice, though as he'd already turned his back on me so he could descend the ancient ladder. Each wooden rung released an alarming creaking at his feet connected with them. I thought for sure one would snap, but he made it down without any issues. He'd lost a lot of weight since the start of our great decomposition. Both of us had. I didn't realize it was a wedding dress until he unzipped the plastic and pulled it free. Is that Mom's? I asked, following him as he dragged it down the hallway toward his bedroom. She never bothered taking it with her when she moved out. Either she forgot about it or didn't give a shit. Honestly, I'm not sure which one's worse. But why do you have it? What was I supposed to do with it? Throw it away? No, I mean, why do you have it now? Oh, I thought it was obvious. We made it to his room. Dead mom was still in his bed, except she didn't have any clothes on. The first thing I noticed were her breasts and how much they had rotted away since we first carried her out of the garden grave. I turned away, a little too quick and almost lost my balance. I could no longer blush, but that didn't mean I couldn't feel embarrassed. Why is she naked? 
I asked. You ever see someone with regular clothes on also wearing a wedding dress? Of course not. It looked ridiculous. You're going to put the dress on her? I asked. The idea sounded insane. I couldn't make any sense of it. Mm Mm-hmm. He proceeded to nod for at least a full minute without saying another word, then added, It's what she would have wanted. I had no idea what he meant by that. I wasn't entirely sure he knew either. Come on, he said. You gonna help or what? Now that I only had one arm, it was difficult to offer much assistance, but I tried my best, and together we managed to wrestle my naked dead mother into her old wedding dress, veil and all. The weirdest thing about it was the dress looked brand new. I felt bad about letting its pristine cleanliness make contact with her decomposing dirt-stained body. I hope my real mom, the one being held in a Corpus Christi hospital, would understand how little choice I'd been given in the matter. Then again, if she really cared about the dress, she probably wouldn't have left it in Dad's attic when we moved out. In her head, it undoubtedly served as this painful reminder of my parents' marriage. She probably never wanted to see it again. I wondered what she would say if she came over and caught this imposter wearing it. Would she want her to take it off? Or would she say, it looks good on you, keep it? To be more realistic, her reaction would likely consist of a scream, followed by several questions such as, what the hell is going on here, and why does that dead body look exactly like me? It was hard to remind myself that Dad and I had plenty of time to cope with this new lifestyle. Outsiders, such as my mother, might not accept you and the other corpses so quickly. Down in Corpus, we already knew Mom was experiencing similar symptoms, but never once did it cross my mind that she had somehow confronted another set of look-alike bodies. No. You, and dead mom, and dead dad, this whole situation felt unique to this specific area. After dead mom was situated in the wedding dress, we both stood above her, admiring her in bed. I had to admit, once the task was complete, I was glad we'd done it. She looked beautiful. My parents had gotten married before I was born, which meant up until that day in Dad's bedroom, I'd never seen my mother in this dress besides in old photographs. It was different in person, even if she wasn't the same person. They were same enough. With the wedding dress on, her various states of decay no longer looked that bad. If anything, the rock complimented her. Such was the power of this dress. Wow, I said, and Dad responded with, I know. I miss her. Me too, he said, with all my heart. Then in a whisper, and now I have her back. Do you think it's time to call someone? I asked. He shook his head, never taking his eyes off the bed. They'd take her away from us. Maybe they'd let us keep her. Not a chance in hell. That was the end of the discussion. He turned, and although he didn't physically push me out of his bedroom, He did motion with his hands that he would push me out if I didn't leave on my own accord. So I left and he closed the door. I didn't return to my room right away. Instead, I explored the house unsupervised. I could have moved the kitchen table and investigated the yard, but there was no point. I knew what I'd find out there and under no circumstances did I want to see it. I preferred pretending nothing had happened and everything was fine and that Andy had simply gone home gone home and left his dog with us. By then, Comrade had peed and pooped all over the house. I couldn't remember the last time either of us had let her outside. That was okay, though. The house was already a cesspool of disease. A little dog poop wasn't going to cause that much extra damage. I did feel bad about forgetting to feed and water her. Fortunately, neither Dad nor myself ever remembered to close the toilet lid, so she'd access to water this entire time. Plus, I soon discovered she'd been helping herself to dead dad's ankles out in the living room. They were dangling out of his sheet we'd thrown over him. She'd enjoyed quite the feast on his spoiled flesh while we isolated ourselves in our individual rooms. He would never walk again, if he'd ever walked in the first place. Despite this ankle buffet, the dog looked hungry. Her ribs were visible every time she inhaled. The girl needed to eat. 
I led her into the kitchen and opened the fridge. There was nothing suitable for a dog inside except for some long expired slices of American cheese, so I closed it and scavenged the cabinets, trying my best not to glance at the table pushed against the door. Comrade kept scratching at the wooden frame below the table. I ignored the noise. Maybe she'd forgotten about what, who, was out there, but I doubted it. How could she? Andy had adopted her when she was a puppy. He was all she'd ever known. The small bag of dog food Andy had bought her on his drugstore run was already empty. None of us had fed it to her. At some point during our week of decomposition, she had ripped the bag open herself and feasted upon its innards. I found a can of chili in the cabinet above our dish rack. Perfect, I thought, up until I attempted to open it and remembered I was minus one limb. And the can was lacking an easy-to-pull tab. The difficulty of this task increased by a thousand percent. I would have probably given up entirely if Comrade hadn't already noticed the can and correctly concluded why I'd taken it out of the cabinet. She was prancing around me, letting out excited howls as I wandered the kitchen trying to locate something sturdy enough to hold the can in place while I worked Dad's mechanical opener. I'm embarrassed to admit exactly how long it took me to realize I could simply sit down and squeeze the can between my thighs. I'm also hesitant to reveal how much of the contents I accidentally spilled on my crotch while trying to wrestle the opener in a circular motion. If Comrade was impatient or irritated by my slowness, she had nobody but herself to blame. She was the one who ate my other arm. I poured the chili into a plastic bowl and set it on the floor. I wondered if she'd like it or if I'd need to cook it first, which worried me because I'd never cooked chili before. My parents had always warned me not to operate the stove without one of them present. Mom was in corpus and Dad was hiding in his bedroom with dead Mom. Dead Dad, on the other hand, wasn't that far away. So if I had to use the stove, maybe he could function as some sort of loophole. But it didn't matter anyway. Comrade dug into the cold chili within half a second of it being available. I filled another bowl with water and set it next to her so she wouldn't have to keep drinking out of the toilet. Then I stepped back and admired my ability to get things accomplished when nobody else was around to supervise. I'd never had a dog of my own, and one of the reasons why, according to my mom, was dogs were a huge responsibility, and she wasn't sure I was quite up to the task yet. Well, I wish she could have seen me feeding and watering Comrade. She would have realized what a fool she'd been to say such a thing. I am great with dogs. It doesn't matter if they chew my limbs off or not. I still love them. In the living room, I stood in front of the couch and stared at the white sheet covering you-know-who and chanted, Dad! 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 But nobody answered. I thought maybe you'd be angry that I left you in my bedroom so long without any company. Something I've learned from first-hand experience is it's incredibly lonely to be a corpse. This must be true for all corpses, especially those buried in cemeteries. Yes, corpses there are surrounded by hundreds of other corpses, but they're still separated just enough so they're alone. Forever. I wonder if those corpses are conscious enough to understand where they're being imprisoned, if they've managed to retain enough memory to remember what a cemetery is, to remind themselves that there are others nearby. Would that knowledge somehow help them cope with their situation? Or would it make things worse? Imagine being crammed in a coffin, then discarded six feet into the soil, forgotten as the rest of the world continues on as if nothing out of the ordinary has happened, as if we aren't dropping dead every single second, as if we're not all trying to beat the unbeatable. Imagine you're trapped inside this coffin, but you don't realize it's a coffin. You don't remember what coffins are anymore. All you know is you can't move. You can't see anything. You can't hear anything. All of your senses are swallowed into a black hole. You are consumed by darkness, and several feet away from you on either side are other corpses locked in similar boxes, all undergoing the same fate. Would it calm you to be aware of this? Or would it instead be better to continue basking in ignorance of existence outside of your own? I don't know. I don't have to deal with that reality. Neither do you, because I have you, and you have me.
but there are other corpses out there who have nobody. They will rot in their coffins alone, forever, and no one will ever hear their stories. But you weren't angry. As far as I could tell, you weren't anything. But that's okay, because neither was I. So I crawled into bed next to you, and together we lay there for who knows how long. I pretended I wasn't jealous that you had two arms, and you pretended you weren't jealous that I could move around and talk. I told you about feeding Comrade a can of chili, and I told you about what happened with Mom's wedding dress, and I told you about my growing fear that my father had lost his mind, and I told you about how sad I was about Andy, and I told you about how worried I was about Mom, and you listened to every word without complaint. It was perfect. Then the doorbell rang, and our lives got exponentially worse. If I'd have known who was waiting behind the door, I wouldn't have hurried out of bed so quickly. But in the heat of the moment, I convinced myself it was Mom. It couldn't be anybody but Mom. It sounded unrealistic that other people in the universe besides her existed. Plus, she always rang the bell when she came over to pick me up. I remember the first couple times she did it, the ringing irritated Dad to no end. He said she was doing it on purpose, to intentionally remind him that she no longer lived here, that she considered herself a mere acquaintance instead of his wife. Message real loud and fucking clear, he whispered, letting her wait outside another couple minutes before finally opening the door. But over time, he got used to the doorbell. Or at least he pretended like he got used to it. He stopped complaining to me about it, at least, which was itself a blessing. I couldn't tell if he heard the doorbell at all. He was too preoccupied with whatever he was doing in his bedroom, with the dead version of my mother, wearing my real mother's wedding dress. It was going to be so awkward when I let her inside and she caught him in there. Not my problem. He'd made his decisions. It was time for me to make mine. Comrade was going nuts at the front door, pawing at the wood, howling at me to hurry up, there's someone here. The door wasn't locked, which I found surprising, given everything going on with us. I thought for sure Dad would have turned the bolt to prevent any intruders from stumbling inside and discovering our little house of rot and decay. Upon further inspection, I realized not only was the door not locked, it wasn't even shut. A strong wind could have easily blown it wide open. The doorbell rang again as I wrapped my hand around the handle. I hesitated, wondering what Mom might look like, if she would be just as grotesque as me and Dad, trying to prepare myself not to react too dramatically, that whatever was waiting for me on the other side of the door, it wasn't my fault. I didn't do this to her, to any of us. Except, it wasn't Mom ringing the doorbell. Instead, I found two other women waiting on the porch. One was Andy's new girlfriend, Candy, and the other wore a white lab coat. Hello, Mr. Dillon, Dr. Winsen Reed said, leaning forward and showing me the same awful smile she'd introduced at the body farm. Is your lovely father home by any chance? Behind her, Candy gasped and covered her mouth. Total shock. Oh, my God! What happened to his arm? Don't be daft, Miss Candace. Judging by the bite marks surrounding the wound, it's quite clear a canine of some kind has torn it off. And, if I had to make a guess, I would accuse the healer presently barking in our ears as the culprit. Unless there are other dogs on the premises. This last question seemed to be directed toward me, so I shook my head and admitted Comrade was the only one of her kind here. Is it also safe to assume that you are not currently in any state of pain? From merely observing your facial expression, you seem to have fallen into some sort of dull acceptance. Uh, I said. Candy coughed and turned away from the front door. (laughs) Do you smell that? It smells like... Work, Dr. Winsen Reed said, irrationally giddy. Then, young Mr. Dillon, may we please obtain your permission to enter your domicile? I believe your acquaintance, Mr. Andrew, is also here, and I must confront him on a most urgent matter. Uh, he isn't here. Dr. Winsenreed cocked her head, curious, trying to figure me out. 
If Mr. Andrew isn't here, then why is his truck currently parked in front of your house? I glanced around at her at the truck. It would be difficult to explain why it was here, but I tried anyway, with a little guidance from my father's previous lies. Oh, I said, he gave it to us. He gave it to you. The anthropologist looked doubtful. Yes, as a gift. There's no way Andy gave y'all his truck, Candy said. He told me that was his pride and joy. It is, I said. He said we could have it, and then he went home. Dr. Winsenreed raised her eyebrow. He went home, as in his current residence? She recited his address, which I did not know, but it sounded like a place someone might live, so I nodded. How'd he get there without his truck, huh? Candy asked. He took a cab, I said, already anticipating this question. I call bullshit, Candy said. Why would he do that? What reason would he have to give you his truck? It was a birthday gift. Whose birthday? My dad's. That's a pretty nice birthday gift for someone and he don't even like that much, Candy said. What are you talking about? I asked, then added, what are you doing here? Candy stepped forward, hands balled into fists. What the fuck do you think we're... Dr. Winsenreed lifted her hand and pushed Candy away. That's enough, Miss Candace. To me, she said, I think it's clear that we are aware of your little predicament, Mr. Dillon. Hence our casual reaction to your missing limb. Not to mention the fact that you quite clearly find yourself undergoing a peculiar sort of skeletonization. Otherwise, we would have expressed a greater concern for your well-being. How do you... Andy told me, Candy said. Which Miss Candace reported directly to me, Dr. Winsen Reed said. Oh, I said. I wondered what would happen if I shut the door and pretended like they weren't on the porch. Would they leave or bust their way inside? If they'd gone through the trouble of coming down here from a body farm, it didn't sound likely that they'd surrender so easily. They were here to do whatever it was they'd set out to do. Are you here to help, or... I asked, unable to comprehend what they wanted. Dr. Winsenry did not bother trying to conceal her impatience. I think it would be wise if you stepped aside, Mr. Dillon. Okay, I said, and did as she requested. The two women entered our house. Neither of them acted too horrified by the state of the living room. Instead, they looked excited. And as the anthropologist gave herself a tour of the house, she never stopped smiling. She had a bizarre gleam in her eyes that I couldn't decipher. Not then, anyway. Took me a while to realize it, but now I understand the truth. The anthropologist was thrilled to be here because what was happening in our house was something she'd been searching for her entire life. Not the specific scenario, no, but the same level of weirdness. Since she was a little girl, Dr. Winsenreed had been on the hunt for the strange, and she tried her best to unearth it up at her body farm, but it wasn't until she stepped through our front door that she legitimately found it. This was why she didn't call the cops. Not even after she'd discovered Andy's corpse in the backyard. Candy had tried, but the anthropologist stopped her, practically slapped a cell phone out of her hand, promised they would loop the authorities into the situation all in due time once the two of them had properly processed everything going on here. I don't know if Candy knew then that the anthropologist was lying, but I caught it right away. And judging by the way Dr. Winsenreed glared at me afterward, she understood I knew the truth which only seemed to cause the grin on her face to widen. And I stayed in the living room as Dr. Winsen Reed and Candy fetched Dad from his bedroom. When they returned, each of them clutching one of his arms, they appeared thoroughly repulsed. It ain't what you think, Dad kept telling them, all the while avoiding eye contact with me. Meanwhile, Comrade had already grown bored with the newcomers and resumed her quest to consume dead dad from the ankles up. Nobody cared enough to stop her. If she was enjoying herself, where was the harm? They guided us toward the love seat and forced us to sit. Each of them easily outpowered either of us. By then, most of our muscle had deteriorated. We could still move around, but slowly, and not with much strength. Dad nudged me with his knee and said, why the hell did you let them in here? I don't know. I'm sorry. 
If they say anything weird about what I was doing in the bedroom, they're lying, okay? They're making shit up. Okay. We are not going to talk about what we witnessed, Mr. Max, Dr. Winsen Reed said. Such conversations are not legally suitable for a boy his age, at least not in the United States. She cleared her throat. <clears throat> Besides, I do believe we have other far more important matters to discuss. Oh, yeah, Dad said. Like what? The anthropologist giggled. You are a very adorable specimen. I ain't no goddamn specimen. Candy couldn't take it anymore and slapped the wall. You killed Andy, you son of a bitch. I loved him. You barely knew him, Dad said. And I didn't kill nobody. Who the hell told you that? They were in the backyard, I said, voice low. What did I tell you about going out there? I didn't. They did. Dad glared at them. You ain't got no right. You ain't got no goddamn right. Fuck your rights, Candy said, fuming with rage. What y'all did was trespassing. Here in Texas, that's a crime. So is murder. I didn't... Hush, Mr. Max, you as well, Miss Candace. Dr. Winsen Reed was viewing us all from the side of the room, as if we were encased in some zoo exhibit. She approached the love seat with a sheet of paper in her hand. Perhaps we can speed things up a bit. Please allow me to explain what we are doing here. Well, shit, Dad said. Explain away, then. As I mentioned earlier, your acquaintance, Mr. Andrew, informed my employee here of your rather curious condition. She, of course, reported this information to me, since that is her job, and she is very good at her job. Aw, Candy said. Thanks, Dr. Winsen Reed. Do not gloat, Miss Candace. I I'm sorry. At first, I was not sure I believed her. I speculated, perhaps, that Mr. Andrew was simply trying to impress my employee with morbid fictions as an attempt to engage in sexual intercourse with her. It would not be the first time. However, the more I thought about our tour of the farm together, the more I started to suspect Mr. Andrew might be telling the truth. If what he told Miss Candace was factual, then that would not only explain your bizarre appearance, but also why the odor of the facility did not affect either of you. It affects everybody who accepts a tour. Additionally, there's the vultures to consider. In all my years working with the dead, not once have I ever witnessed a vulture attack the living. It is, quite simply, unheard of. Vultures can see through disguises. They can sniff out the dead from miles away. The moment you arrived at our little facility, they understood what you were. To be perfectly honest, I find myself feeling embarrassed that I didn't realize it myself. It is possible I'm getting too old for this job. It is also possible I was simply blindsided by your general attractiveness, Mr. Max. I am, after all, only human. I possess certain desires like anybody else. Do I find it troubling that I was aroused by what has turned out to essentially be a walking corpse? No, not in the slightest. Am I still attracted to you after discovering the truth? Of course, without a doubt. Would I consider exploring these feelings with your consent? Not in front of your son. That would be wildly inappropriate. Uh, Dad said. What does this have to do with... Excuse me, Dr. Winsen Reed said. Her cheeks had turned red. I'm getting off the topic and I apologize. She sucked in a deep breath and exhaled. What's important is this. A couple of days after learning of your condition, Miss Candace approached me again with a new concern. Mr. Andrew had ceased all communication. He no longer answered his phone when she called. He no longer replied to her text. He had simply vanished from her life, which is why Miss Candace came to me for help. She feared something bad might have happened and was too afraid to go to this house by herself. She asked me if I would accompany her. At first, I told her that would go beyond my duties as her employer, but then I realized this might give me a second chance to interact with you and your son, so I agreed. Imagine our reaction when we discovered this note on Mr. Andrew's refrigerator waiting for us. She handed Dad the sheet of paper. I leaned forward so I could read over his shoulder. This is what it said. Candy, if you are reading this, then that means my fears have come true. Max is not what he says he is. Probably not his son either. I have returned to his house to confront them. I do not know how they will react. They might continue denying the truth or they might lash out. If they get violent, I don't know what will happen. 
I hope they aren't what I think they are, but I won't know for sure until I go back. If you don't hear from me again, then I was right all along, and I'm a fool for walking directly into their trap. Don't believe a word they say. They are not of this world. I don't know exactly where they came from, but I know for damn sure it ain't anywhere near here. They came to Earth for one reason, to integrate themselves into our society and slowly conquer the planet one suburban residence at a time. I don't even know if Max is the first victim or one of several hundred thousand others. It's possible we are already too late and we are among the remaining few left unviolated. It's also possible I'm wrong, in which case you will never read this letter. I always thought this would happen, but I'm still surprised the time has actually come. Why did they have to take Dylan too? He's just a boy. He never hurt a goddamn soul in his life. Well, now he's one of them, so fuck him too, I guess. I am sorry that we won't be spending any more time together. I wish I had mustered the courage to ask you out earlier than when I did. The truth is, you intimidated me, and I was scared. The truth is, I'm an idiot. The truth is, I think you are incredibly cute, and I am bummed we never got a chance to properly make love. However, the hand stuff we did to each other was nice while it lasted. I'm not even upset that your fingernail cut me. Actually, it felt kind of nice. I think we could have had a good life together. Andy. P.S. Here's those fuckers' address. Burn it to the ground. Don't worry, Dr. Winsen Reed said after taking the letter back and handing it to Candy. Unlike Mr. Andrew, I do not believe you are extraterrestrials. We don't know that for sure, Candy said. Don't be silly, Miss Candace. I think we can safely speculate that. The anthropologist paused, attention caught on the couch particularly on the white sheet covering a large human-shaped object. Is this... is this what I think it is? Depends on what you think it is, Dad said. Mr. Andrew told tall tales of doppelgangers. Well, then, yes, that's what you think it is. She reached forward, then stopped, glanced at Dad. May I? You actually asking? No, I suppose not. She pulled the sheet off and dropped it at her feet, revealing dead dad in all his glory. For the most part, he had decomposed at the same rate as living dad, except, thanks to comrade, this version of my father no longer possessed any feet. Where these feet had disappeared to, none of us were quite sure. Could she have eaten the entire foot of each leg? The bones and all? It didn't sound possible, but then again... It wasn't like we were residing in a house infamous for its logic. Either way, the dog appeared full and content in the corner of the living room, where she'd curled up into a ball and fallen into a deep sleep. But besides the missing feet, dead dad and living dad remained identical. At this point, both of them had lost a majority of their flesh, leaving behind only thin layers of protection. Bones poked free here and there. Their cheeks had started caving into their skulls. It was not a great sight, and I promised myself never to look in a mirror again, which was a useless vow, considering I could have returned to my room and looked at you instead. Holy chief, the anthropologist said, unable to take her eyes off the couch. How? Candy said, on the verge of stuttering. How can can this be? Dr. Winsenreed pointed at me. And you? There's one of you, too, is there not? He's in my bedroom, I said, feeling oddly guilty for ratting you out. To Dad, she said, And what about the one we caught you with? Is there an animated replica floating around here somewhere, like the two of you? What the fuck did you just call us? Dad said. Is there or is there not? Dr. Winsenreed asked. His mother? No, she's out of town. Where is she? Tell me again how that's any of your business. Mr. Max, do I need to remind you that presently you are a walking, talking corpse? And that sitting across from you is an identical version of yourself. I am trying to figure out what is going on here. I'm offering my assistance, which I hope you don't mind me saying you appear to desperately need. Dad reclined against the love seat cushion, sticking out his atrophied chest in a classic act of stubbornness. 
We were doing just fine before you got here, and we'll continue doing just fine after you leave. So if you don't mind, the front door is over there. He offered a little nod toward the door in case they required visual guidance. Dr. Winsenreed leaned forward, bar in her teeth. Mr. Max, I apologize for misrepresenting the situation, but please allow me to reassure you. My associate and I do not intend on embarking from these premises any time soon, regardless of your permission. If you wish to report our act of trespassing to the authorities, please, by all means, we will not prevent you from contacting them. However, once they arrive, I am sure they will have plenty of other questions for you to answer. Let us not forget what, or should I say who, is currently residing in a hole behind your house. Dad didn't seem to have much to say about that. The anthropologist redirected her gaze toward me. Mr. Dillon, perhaps you can help me. I am curious as to the whereabouts of your mother. Don't tell her shit, Dad muttered. But the answer was already half out my mouth. Corpus Christi? The body of Christ, she replied, surprised. What? I said. She dismissed my question with one of her own. What is she doing in Corpus Christi? She's on vacation. Vacation? The anthropologist appeared amused. Without her son? It was my goddamn weekend, Dad said. And do we know if she's experiencing similar symptoms? Dad and I exchanged glances, trying to mentally communicate with each other how to answer this question. Wait a second, the anthropologist said, studying us. Are you too telepathic? You have to tell me if you are. We ain't telepathic, Dad said, and he turned to me. Are we? I don't think so, I said. Tell me about your mother, Mr. Dillon. And if I were capable of tears, I would have broken into a crying fit. Instead, I calmly explained the situation with Mom up in the Corpus Hospital. Dad helped elaborate on a few details I didn't quite understand, which led to us telling the anthropologist everything, from the Friday afternoon we dug up the garden grave until they burst into our living room uninvited. It was the second time we'd had to recite the story, first to Andy, except back then the tale had been far shorter. And I guess right now, when I'm telling you, this would make the third time I've had to go over it. The story of how I found you and everything that followed. After I'm done here, I hope I never have to tell it again. Dead or alive, digging up all these memories is exhausting. Wait, Candy said, sounding like she was on the verge of crying again. None of this explains why the hell you had to do what you did to Andy. There was no reason for it. There was no reason. I've said what I had to say, Dad said. He's dead because of you. Dead! You weren't here. He flipped out, went psycho. To me, he said, go on, tell him what happened, how he was behaving. He tied us up, I said, which was true. It wasn't like Dad was making up lies about Andy. The day of his death, something had snapped in him. There was no way to predict what he'd planned after he grew tired of digging holes in our yard. What if he intended on burying the two of us in them? Dr. Winsenreed retrieved Andy's ropes from the kitchen chairs in the living room and held them up like they were evidence, which I suppose they were. Tied you up with these, I presume? She said. Yeah. And how did you manage to escape? I lifted what remained of my arm. Ah, she said, winking. Very clever, Mr. Dillon. Very, very clever. Uh, thanks. She tossed the ropes to Candy and said, I'll hold them down while you secure the knots. You what? Dad said. Hold you down, Mr. Max, the anthropologist replied matter-of-factly. Although, to be perfectly honest, I do not believe I will need to apply much pressure. You do not appear to be in the strongest state at the moment. You'll do no such goddamn thing. It would be in your best interest not to resist, Mr. Max. I'm rather confident I could snap your bones without much difficulty. Perhaps by accident. I don't think either of us would prefer that to happen. There's no reason to tie us up, Dad said. It's unnecessary and it's rude. The anthropologist cocked her head, amused with Dad's reasoning. Mr. Max, do I need to remind you of the fate that befell your acquaintance behind this very residence? A fate that you initiated. I initiated no such goddamn thing. 
We're going to restrain you. I recommend you keep still. Dad looked like he was about to put up a fight, but once they started tying the ropes around his body, he remained unresponsive. He didn't try to escape, but he certainly didn't go out of his way to make the experience any easier for them. Next, they came for me. There was no use asking them to leave me alone. If they could overpower my father, then I stood less of a chance. What good could I do with only one arm? They wrapped the ropes around our shoulders and chests, too, so I couldn't take advantage of my missing limb this time, rendering the amputation pointless. Okay, Dad said. You got us tied up. Congratulations. You did it. Now what? Now? Dr. Winsen Reed grinned, as if she'd been waiting for Dad to ask that question. She leaned forward so he could get a better glimpse of her teeth. Now, Mr. Max, we run some tests. They spent the rest of the day running various types of tests. Most of them I didn't understand, and they weren't willing to offer many explanations, no matter how many times Dad said, What the hell are you doing to us? We had no choice but to sit on the love seat and let them do what they were going to do. They also transported both you and dead mom back to the couch to sit beside dead dad. She was still wearing mom's wedding dress. First, the anthropologist ordered Candy to go outside and fetch their supplies. This ended up requiring multiple trips since she had to do it by herself. Dr. Winsenreed refused to abandon the living room and help. She didn't trust leaving us alone in case we had any other tricks up our sleeves which sounded like an unnecessarily cruel accusation to make, considering my current handicap. They collected pieces of our rotten flesh and studied them under microscopes, jotting down their findings in little notebooks, comparing our bodies against you and the other two corpses. Sometimes they nodded in approval. Other times, they shook their heads in disgust, muttering silently to themselves. Dr. Winsenreed gave Candy directions with the unique form of sign language they'd probably naturally created together while working at the body farm. All Dad and I could do was watch. He gave up asking what they were doing. It was useless. They weren't interested in answering our questions. It was hard to accept at first, but it was true. The house had acquired a new presence, and they were the ones in charge. It happened so quickly, so unexpectedly. One minute, Dad and I were rotting together while re-watching The Simpsons. The next, we are tied up on the love seat while a mad scientist studied every inch of our bodies. And that was life, I guess. Sometimes these things happen. Not often, but not never. It happened to me, after all. And it happened to you. When the anthropologist pulled out a hammer from their body farm supplies, I assumed she decided to finally obliterate us and move on with their life. Assumed and hoped. The whole process of them running tests on us had quickly become exhausting. Most of the studies they'd conducted on us made little sense. The suspense of whether or not they share their feelings with us evaporated within the first couple hours. It might have been the first time since we'd started decomposing that I felt bored. But the hammer wasn't for putting us out of our misery. I doubted we could be anyway. Instead, the anthropologist crouched next to the love seat and lightly tapped the hammer against my kneecap. Waited a couple seconds, then tapped it again. How does that feel? Dr. Winsenreed asked, glancing up at me. Don't tell her shit, Dad said. If they can't answer our questions, then why should we cooperate? Mr. Dillon, the anthropologist said, and tapped me a third time with the hammer. How does that feel? I don't know, I said, which was the truth. It doesn't really feel like anything. Ah, interesting. Then, in one quick motion, she raised the hammer and swung it with sudden speed toward my face, stopping only an inch or two from making contact. I did not flinch, which is what I suspect she was trying to make me do. Afterward, she tossed the hammer on the floor. Interesting. Very interesting. What are you thinking, Dr. Wizenreed? Candy asked. She was sitting across the living room, petting Comrade. She looked so tired, I was pretty sure she would have fallen asleep the moment she stopped stroking the dog. What am I thinking? 
The anthropologist appeared caught off guard by the question. She rubbed the bridge of her nose and yawned. What am I thinking? I'm thinking... I'm thinking I need several helpings of alcohol. That is what I'm thinking. To Dad, she said, I'm assuming a man of your stature possesses an adequate stock of alcoholic beverages somewhere upon his property. Don't you dare lay a finger on my booze, you maggot-loving bitch. Oh, Mr. Max, Dr. Winsenreed said, a little giddy. Save the pillow talk for later. It took them all of two minutes to locate Dad's whiskey, probably because Andy had left it out on the kitchen counter and none of us had bothered to return it to its cupboard. Comrade followed them into the kitchen in case Candy felt the need to continue petting her. We listened from the love seat as they each poured a glass of liquor and vented about the situation they'd forced themselves into. I overheard things like, I've never seen anything like this before in my life, and this goes against everything we know to be true about human bodies, and I don't know what to do, and should we call for help, and under no circumstances. When they returned to the living room, both were remarkably drunker than before they left us. They each took a seat on the kitchen chairs Andy had previously used to tie us up on. They'd also refilled their glasses. First of all, Dr. Winsenreed said, I would like to apologize for consuming a depressant while on the job. However, it is not like any of us will be receiving a paycheck for the work we are doing here. Perhaps one day, deep into the future, we will be recognized for our bravery and our willingness to investigate the bizarre and unrecognizable. I suppose that will depend on what exactly we conclude. Because right now, our findings are not looking the most promising. None of this makes sense, which I am sure you both also know. We gave up trying to figure it out, Dad said. Well, that does not surprise me, as you do not strike me as a man of science. I, on the other hand, have dedicated my entire life to science. And yet you're no closer to cracking this mystery either. Mr. Max, I do not say this lightly, but that kind of attitude is not as attractive as you might think it is. Dr. Winsenreed sipped from her glass of brown liquor. So then, share with us what information you've managed to gather before our arrival. If you had to speculate as to why this is happening or what is happening, what would you say? Don't you understand? Dad said. Doesn't fucking matter why it's happening. Not now, anyway. Whatever's going on, it's way too late to put a stop to it. I mean, fucking look at us. We're skeletons. You think our flesh is just going to magically grow back and everything's going to be nice and peachy again? Dr. Winsenreed ignored Dad's response and redirected her attention over to me. What about you, Mr. Dillon? Corpse flowers, I blurted out. Corpse flowers, she said, curious. No, my God, Dad said. Enough with the corpse flower shit. Wait a minute, Dr. Winsenreed held up her palm to shush him. I want to hear what Mr. Dillon has to say. I told her my theory about the seeds from a corpse flower plant being relocated by birds and dropped in Mom's garden. Oh, I see, she said. And have you collected any further evidence indicating this theory's likelihood? Uh, no. She nodded. Yeah, that sounds like nonsense. Are, are corpse flowers r real? Candy asked, once again providing Comrade with lots of love and attention. Of course they're real, Dr. Winsenreed said. However, they probably aren't what you are imagining. They don't grow corpses, as Mr. Dillon here has loosely implied. Then why are they called that? The odor they emit while blossoming is similar to a body decomposing. Oh, Candy said. That's pretty cool. Yes, Dr. Winsenreed said. It's very cool. It's also not relevant to the situation. I don't believe these flowers grow in Texas. Yes, they do, I said. There was one in Galveston a couple years ago. It was named Morticia. Equally irrelevant, the anthropologist said. 
In case you've forgotten, Mr. Dillon, we are not in Galveston. We are in San Antonio. And it is not a couple of years ago. It is now. The only detail of merit you've given me is the plant's name. Morticia is perfect for a corpse flower. Whoever named it that should be awarded a prize of some kind. Nothing too ambitious, but something subtle to let them know their naming techniques have not gone unadmired. Regardless of their reaction, I felt my theory was substantial enough not to disregard, but I kept quiet after that, too afraid of further ridicule. And his alien idea makes more sense than corpse flowers, Dad said, and I don't even believe in goddamn aliens. Dr. Winsenreed turned away from us and kneeled next to dead dad on the couch across the living room. What about you then? She said almost in a whisper. What do you suspect is happening here? Dead dad did not answer. Neither did dead mom and neither did you. Y'all remained perfectly calm, seated on the couch. Most of your flesh long rotted away to nothing. Why should I answer that? Living Dad finally replied. Why should I bother saying a goddamn thing to you? Because, Mr. Max, you are left with very little choice. Whether you wish to accept it or not, I am the only help you're going to receive. It's either us or the authorities. And do you honestly expect Texas police to treat this situation delicately? Why do you want to help so much? The anthropologist stepped back like Dad's question had physically punched her. Why do I want to help? Because I am a scientist. When will I ever get another chance to study decomposition under these specific circumstances again? Haven't you studied us enough already? Oh, Mr. Max. She shook her head and leaned forward. We haven't even started yet. Wait, Candy said behind her. I thought we started like hours ago. The anthropologist straightened her spine and sighed. I was attempting to be dramatic, Miss Candace. Oh, Candy said, visibly embarrassed. I'm sorry. Somehow, they got Dad to reveal his secret theory, and once he started talking, I couldn't believe the words that came out of his mouth. It's all his mother's fault, he said, nodding toward me on the love seat next to him. His mother, Dr. Winsenreed said, alternatively known as your ex-wife. We all shared a moment of silence as we glanced at dead mom on the couch. Still wearing the wedding dress, of course she was. It wasn't like any of us were going to take it off. Now that she had it on, it belonged to her. Just as my Don't Have a Cow Man t-shirt belonged to you. Mom didn't do this, I said. She isn't even here. It was her garden, wasn't it? Dad said, asking a question that didn't need to be asked. We all knew it was her garden. It was the one thing we did know. The anthropologist gulped down the rest of her liquor and stumbled around the living room. She seemed to be enjoying herself. So what exactly are you attempting to imply here? Yes, it was your ex-wife's garden. Are you speculating that she knew what was underneath? Why wouldn't she have known? Dad said. It'd be weirder if she didn't know. Too much of a coincidence to plant something in the same exact place we'd end up finding what we found. A coincidence, yes, I would agree with that. A rather strong one. She knew it was down there. That's why she never gave me shit about me keeping the house. She couldn't have been more eager to move out when we separated. Like she knew exactly what was growing in that ground, and she wanted no part of it. So you suspect she personally planted these specimen? Of course she planted them. Who else would have? Dylan? I didn't plant them, I said choosing to omit the fact that I did help my mother originally plant her garden. We certainly hadn't buried anything resembling human, but I didn't want to give them any further ammo. The way this conversation was heading felt dangerous, unpredictable. Well then, there you have it, Dad said to the anthropologist. His mother planted them. Your ex-wife, 
Dr. Winston Reed added. Why do you keep saying that? Scientists are required to reconfirm facts in case they were somehow fed false information. What false information? Are you two legally divorced? Why would I lie about that? Dr. Winston Reed shrugged. Perhaps you were hoping to trick me into bed. Despite his face having mostly rotted away by then, Dad managed to form an expression of absolute disgust. What is wrong with you? I'll have you know, Mr. Max, that scientists have feelings too. Wait, Candy said, working on finishing her liquor. I don't get it. How do you, like, plant another human being, though? With human beings, I whispered, trying not to laugh and realizing I couldn't remember how to anyway. It didn't matter. No one seemed to hear me, or if they did, they were choosing to ignore my hilarious joke. Wishcraft, maybe, Dad said. No one laughed at his joke either, except it turned out he wasn't joking. As a scientist, Dr. Winston Reed said, I am typically opposed to all serious discussions of the supernatural. However, under the circumstances, I am willing to entertain this theory a little further. Oh. Dad said. Well, I guess I don't exactly know what I mean by that. I don't know shit about that kind of stuff. But maybe she did, right? Maybe she was secretly into witch crap. And I don't know. Maybe she plucked our hairs when we were asleep or something and buried them under her garden. Your hairs, the anthropologist said. Well, sure, isn't that what those witches always do in movies? Which witches? Candy said. Dr. Winston Reed turned to her assistant. Which witches? Are you asking me? Candy said. I don't know which witches. She pointed at Dad. He's the one who brought it up. But why are you pronouncing it like that? Pronouncing it like what? Like you've suddenly developed a stutter. I don't have a stutter. Say it again, the anthropologist said. What, witches? There, she said. You're getting the hang of it. My mom isn't a witch. I said. I would have known if she was. She would have told me. We had a special relationship. She didn't keep secrets like that from me. Just like that fucking movie, Dad said. Dylan, you remember the fucking bathroom movie? We watched it a while back with the tornado. I knew exactly what movie he was talking about, but I chose not to respond. There's some witchy shit in that one, too, Dad continued. They do these spells with like a a tongue or something. And the world goes ape shit. Or maybe something else calls the end of the world. The movie never really explains it too well. Oh yeah, I saw that one, Candy said. The ending was terrible. Yup, Dad said. It just ends like abruptly for no reason at all. God damn, that movie sucked. Wait a second, the anthropologist said. Are you referring to the motion picture about the bathroom that opens outward rather than inward? That's the one. I couldn't stomach the architectural inaccuracies. The least I could have done was show us what was happening outside the bathroom, Candy said. I hate it when movies leave mysteries open-ended like that. That's lazy writing is what it is, Dad said. Dr. Winston Reed cleared her throat. Suppose this witchcraft theory holds some merit. What reason would your ex-wife have for conducting such a bizarre spell? Hell if I know, Dad said. Maybe she's crazy. Honestly, her being a nutcase explains a lot of things. Like why she left you? Candy asked. Who says I didn't leave her? She glanced down at dead mom in the wedding dress. Okay, he said. That's fair. Perhaps. Dr. Winston Reed said, Your ex-wife was planning on replacing her family, you two specifically. But why make one of herself too? Candy asked. Wait, scratch that. It would be pretty cool to have a clone. I'd make her do all the stupid shit I don't want to do while I hang out at home watching Netflix all day. If I had a clone of myself, the anthropologist said, I would get twice as much science done. Together, we would be unstoppable. Other scientists would hear about my productivity and tremble in their inferior boots. 
Dr. Winsenreed drifted her attention away from the love seat and approached the couch again where the three of you were seated. She knelt so she was eye level with everybody and didn't say anything for an uncomfortable length of time. Candy stumbled into the kitchen, then returned with both of their glasses refilled. She handed one of them to Dr. Winsenreed, who accepted it without breaking her concentrated gaze away from the corpse couch. Nobody said anything. The atmosphere felt too thick with tension. Neither Dad nor myself could predict what this drunk body farm operator would do next. I was also beginning to doubt she knew what she was going to do either. At a certain point, their actions came off as improvised, like they were mostly winging things to see what would stick, which would explain what happened next. If not for Comrade, I don't think the anthropologist would have ever gotten the idea to do what she did. Where would that leave us then? I don't know exactly, but I imagine far fewer people would have ended up dead. Except that's not what happened. So why bother losing ourselves in the what ifs? Because Comrade was there, and the anthropologist did take a keen interest in her presence. I never had a dog of my own she told us later that evening, on her third or fourth refill of Dad's liquor. Not even as a young child growing up in, well, you don't need to know where I was raised, but not even then. My mother and father forbade it. Not because they were cruel parents, mind you. Cruel? No. But cowards? Absolutely. How were they cowards? I asked, always a sucker for talking about animals, dogs being a particular weakness of mine. Well, Mr. Dillon, they were afraid of what I might do to a pet were they to give me one. You see, I expressed an interest in science from an exceptionally young age, and I took the job very seriously, unlike the other children in my class who were all far too busy stacking blocks and soiling diapers. My mother and father understood that this was not some little kid phase I found myself in. They recognized I was fortunate enough to discover my true calling in life. And that terrified them, because anything remotely scientific represented itself as an impossible puzzle from their perspective. However, there are a few things even the dimmest brain on this planet can understand when it comes to science, and one of those is eventually a scientist will require living specimens to continue her studies. They assumed, perhaps rightfully so, that if they were to gift me a canine, it would only be a matter of time before I conducted experiments on the animal. What kind of experiments, I asked. Oh, I don't know anything specific, Dr. Winsen Reed said, then paused. Except, and sipped from her glass again before continuing. Except, come to think about it, there was one particular experiment that always fascinated me. One that involved a dog. Two dogs, in fact. I'd read about it as a little girl, and now, all these years later, those details maintain a permanent residence deep inside me. As today's youth would phrase the phenomenon, it resides rent-free in my head. On the other side of the room, Candy let out a groan. The anthropologist ignored her assistant's disapproval and continued. There was a scientist. Vladimir Demikov, a Soviet, naturally, a true pioneer in transplantology. I'm sure you've all heard of him. Crickets in the room. Are you serious? Not a single one of you know who Vladimir Demikov is? The crickets grew bolder. She glanced over at Candy and said, now I know I am being bamboozled, Miss Candace, if you are claiming to have never heard the name Vladimir Demikov. I only am constantly referring to his many accomplishments. In fact, I can imagine a single day on the facility has ever passed without me having made at least one comment about Vladimir Demikov. After all, he is my hero. Oh, wait! Candy snapped her fingers like how people do in movies when they've suddenly remembered something. Is he that two-headed dog guy? Dr. Winsenreed was quiet for a second, digesting Candy's disrespectful response. 
If by two-headed dog guy you mean the genius who successfully performed a transplantation consisting of one dog's head onto the body of another dog, then yes, that is who I am referring to. That is exactly correct. What the fuck are you talking about? Dad asked, which was the same question on the tip of my tongue. I thought you made all that up, Candy said. He really did that? That's pretty gnarly. Dr. Winsenreed patted her chest, either offended or trying to fight off a heart attack. You thought I made up, Vladimir Demikov? No, I didn't think you made the person up. I just thought, you know, the dog thing wasn't true. Do you realize what you are doing, Miss Candace? Dr. Winsenreed asked. You are embarrassing me in front of our test subjects. You are demonstrating that they no longer have to respect me, that they can doubt my knowledge and tactics, and there will be zero consequences. I am? Jeez, Dr. Winsenreed, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Hold the fucking phone, ladies, Dad said. Are you trying to say this guy put a dog's head on another dog? The anthropologist grinned, seemingly pleased by my father's response. Yes, Mr. Max, that is precisely what I am saying. But why and how? What happened to it? Did it live? I asked, which felt like the only question that mattered. My, 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 so much interrogation. I love it. The anthropologist took another swig of my father's alcohol. To answer your wonderful questions one at a time, let's begin with why. Why would Vladimir Demikov create a two-headed dog? Much like myself, he lived and breathed science. Everything he did was for the betterment of mankind. His motives were pure. He didn't just experiment with heads, mind you. He was also the first to perform heart and lung transplants on animals. And why would he do that? Because, Mr. Max and Mr. Dillon, once we have perfected a surgical procedure on an animal, we can then safely transition our experience and knowledge onto human test subjects. Although, if you were to ask my opinion on the matter, I would suggest there is little difference between the two, except for the fact that humans defecate in toilets and animals embrace the freedom of relieving themselves wherever they please. Cats can use the toilets. I said, the words spilling out of my mouth before I could stop them. Cats? Dr. Winsenreed said, physically appalled. Operating a porcelain commode? In this climate? I find that highly unlikely. It's true. I saw a video on YouTube. Someone trained their cat to do it. You're telling lies, Mr. Dillon. You are sitting there lying straight to my face. Me, an elder. I do not appreciate that magnitude of impertinence, sir. Do you think we drove all the way down here to entertain such blatant fantasy? I wasn't making this up, and I was fully prepared to continue arguing until she believed me, but Dad decided right then was the perfect time to cut in. It's not toilets that separates us, you goddamn idiots. It's thumbs. Every eye in the room directed toward my father, including comrades. Thumbs? Dr. Winsenreed said. Yeah, thumbs. Humans are the only ones who have them. That's why we survive so long as a species. We can protect our shelters with doorknobs and animals aren't equipped with the physical attributes to turn them. Because they ain't got any goddamn thumbs. Same reason we can use guns and hitchhike on the highway. Don't monkeys have thumbs? Candy said. Uh, yeah, Dad said. But so what? Aren't monkeys basically dumb humans anyway? Isn't that what they teach you in school nowadays? All that Stephen Hawking evolution bullshit? Opossums also have thumbs, Dr. Winsenreed said. No, they fucking don't. I would be extremely curious to hear if you have ever laid eyes upon an opossum, Mr. Max. I mean, not like a clear look or anything, but I've seen plenty splattered on the road. But you have never gotten out of your automobile and closely inspected whether or not one of these corpses possessed an opposable thumb. Why the hell would I do that? 
I just assumed you must have, considering the substantial level of authority you're exhibiting about the subject. All I'm saying is, possums or opossums or whatever the hell had thumbs, that's something I would have heard before. It would be common knowledge. Pandas have opposable thumbs too, the anthropologist said. Oh, fuck off, Dad said. So you know more about thumbs than I do. Who cares? She smirked, proud of having gotten my father all riled up about the thumbs. Now, the how part of your dog experiment question is where things get a bit complicated. You don't know, Dad said, trying to challenge her. Of course I know, you decomposing dimwit. But do I know how to explain it in simple enough terms for a man of your abysmal intelligence to accurately comprehend? That, Mr. Max, is where I begin to doubt my capabilities. Where did he get the dogs? I asked. It was around then that I first started getting worried about Comrade being in the presence of the anthropologist and her assistants. Andy had left her in our possession, willingly or not, and by doing so she had become our responsibility. What kind of mature, caring dog owner Would I be if I allowed the very first mad scientist to come along, perform a bunch of depraved experiments on her? Despite my setbacks, one-armed, tied up, mostly a skeleton, I silently vowed not to let anything bad happen to Comrade. If I recall correctly, Dr. Wizenreed said, I believe they were strays him and his team apprehended in the streets of Moscow. So... They belong to other families? I asked. Families that were not properly equipped to raise and shelter an animal, yes. That's always a possibility when one is picking up strays for scientific purposes. Have you ever picked up strays? No, Mr. Dillon, I have never owned an animal, neither with scientific nor leisurely agendas. As I already mentioned, my mother and father prohibited it. They had no reason to fear, however, at least not when it came to pet ownership. Even at a young age, I understood that within me existed zero interest in experimenting on the living. No, what caught my eye and continues to catch it is the very same reason why I was drawn to your lovely residence earlier today. It is the same reason why I have not left and refused to do so until I've learned everything there is to learn on this property. There is death here and not an ordinary kind of death. This is an unknowable death, which means, dear Mr. Dillon, that I will do whatever it takes to know it. Otherwise, what was the point of everything else in my life preceding to this moment? I strangely felt bad for the anthropologist. No child should be deprived of a pet. I knew that from first-hand experience. But at least there was always comrade for me to play with, although not as often as I would have preferred, especially after the divorce, when everybody stopped speaking to each other. Except for me. I would have spoken to anyone. I didn't care. Did it work? Dad said. Did the dogs live once, you know, the second head was attached? Yes and no, Dr. Wizenreed said finishing off her second glass of alcohol and shoving it in Candy's hands for a refill. They attempted the surgery a little over twenty times. Twenty-five, I want to say, but I would not place any money on it, mostly because gambling is for cowards. Some results showed more promise than others. One of the most successful experiments lasted only four days, although it's speculated that they would have lived much longer had a vein in one of their necks not been damaged. Why is he your hero? I asked. It seemed like a good question at that point, after hearing what we'd heard. Because, Mr. Dillon, he was the man who made me realize how exciting and mysterious science can be. That it can transcend a textbook. That it can be raw and transgressive and potentially change the world. And that is exactly what I aim to prove here in this domicile, with all of you as my witnesses. To dead dad, she added, including you, regardless of whether or not you possess an inkling of what's happening here. She hesitated, then stepped closer to the couch, raising her voice. Can you hear me? 
Is the language emitting from my vocal cords forming any sort of comprehension to you and dead mom? For any of you? No answer. No sign whatever that y'all understood anything she was saying. She made a wet sign noise, like maybe she was drowning, and grabbed her glass from candy, refilled again. She drank and thought, and the rest of us had little choice but to watch and wait for whatever was going to happen to happen. Of course, we both know what happened, don't we? We were there, after all. We witnessed the experiment firsthand. Whether you want to admit it or not, you were there and you saw the same things as I did. Okay, I have an idea, the anthropologist finally whispered, calmer, the alcohol doing its job. But from the tone of her voice, I couldn't help but wonder if maybe this idea wasn't as fresh and spontaneous as she was selling it, that maybe she'd been long trying to figure out a natural way to transition into this specific conversation. Why else would she have brought up Vladimir Demikov and his two-headed dog? The anthropologist was good and drunk when she confidently said, The procedure shouldn't be as difficult as it sounds. I don't see why I wouldn't be able to pull it off. Because you're not a trained surgeon, Candy said. Miss Candace. Forgive my shaky memory, but is it within your job description to doubt my capabilities? Uh, No, I don't think so. Then maybe bite your tongue next time. You do not have anything productive to contribute, hmm? Yes, Dr. Wizenreed. Good. Now, be a dear and fetch me some extra supplies at the farm. She handed Candy a sheet of paper she'd scribbled a list on. Candy glanced at the items and snorted. <laughs> Dr. Winston Reed, I promise I'm not trying to doubt you or behave uh, argumentative, but are you sure all these supplies are at work? Indeed they are, Miss Candace. You will find the majority of them in my office, hidden deep in the closet with the Dunder Mifflin poster on the door. The rest you will find in our examination room. But, but... Why do you have some of this stuff? Because a good scientist is always prepared. Wait, she said. Are you sure I should be driving? I'm kind of toasted. If you can walk in a straight line, you're capable of driving. You want me to walk in a straight line? Indeed I do, Miss Candace. Uh, okay, I'll give it a shot. Candy took two steps forward and tripped over her own feet. On the floor, she erupted into laughter. There, see, Dr. Winsenreed said, also amused by her assistant's collapse. You're fit as a fiddle. Now, skedaddle, time is wasting. After Candy left the house, Dr. Winsenreed stumbled into the kitchen and returned with the bottle of brown alcohol, no longer bothering to pour it into a glass. Instead, she wrapped her lips around the neck of the bottle and let it spill down her cheeks as she guzzled. What kind of supplies is she getting? Dad asked. What are you planning on doing? Tell me, Mr. Max, do you think Vladimir Demikov informed his canines of his intentions before carrying out his experiments? What? Leave Comrade alone, I shouted. Comrade? You mean her? She petted Comrade on the head. I would never lay a malicious finger on this beautiful beast. Haven't you two been paying attention to a word I've said? I've no interest in experimenting on the living, and certainly not dogs. Then what the fuck are you talking about? Dad said. Isn't it obvious? Dr. Winsenreed said, swinging the near-empty bottle of liquor as she spoke. I'm going to create the world's first two-headed man. Later, she clarified. To be fair, many humans have been born with two heads before. Think of conjoined twins. However, no one has ever transplanted one human head onto another human's body, which is what I'm going to do tonight, as soon as my assistant returns with the necessary supplies. And much later, Dad finally replied, Um, I don't think you should do that. Unfortunately, 
The anthropologist didn't seem to be interested in considering any feedback from us. And why would she? In her eyes, we weren't people. Not really. We were bodies waiting to be studied. We were homework. And judging from the way she danced around the living room as we waited for Candy to return, she was on a tight deadline. The alcohol hit Dr. Winsenreed like a brick. Oh, she said, legs wobbly, words slurring, and crashed onto the carpet next to the love seat, between my father's legs, resting the back of her head against his crotch, staring up at the ceiling. Tell me something, Mr. Max. Is the room suddenly spinning? Please don't vomit on me, Dad said. I would never do such a thing. She promised, then winked and added, Not without your consent, of course. You know, you don't need to do this. It's not too late to change your mind. For some reason, the anthropologist found this hysterical. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Mr. Max, she said, recovering from her giggling fit. Let me tell you something wonderful. Uh, okay. You see all these flies? She waved in a vague direction. It didn't matter. Flies could be found in any area of the house. You see all these beautiful, majestic dipterans? Dip what? Do you think they are simply here by choice? Do you think they are not aware of the generous gift you and your son have offered them? I, I don't think they think at all, Dad said. They're fucking flies. Who cares? Who cares? Dr. Winsenreed pressed herself away from my father's crotch and glared at him over her shoulder. Is that what you said? Who cares? Yeah, Dad said. Sometimes you can be a heartless bastard, Mr. Max. Are you aware of this? Now you sound like my ex-wife. I once read a study conducted by Bill Bass and Bill Rodriguez. They were both named Bill. Many people are named Bill. It's a common name, the anthropologist said. Bass, as I'm sure you already know, is the genius who founded the original body farm over in Tennessee. Him and Rodriguez one day, while conducting various insect studies, decided to do something a little unorthodox. Unorthodox if you're a coward, I mean. Of course, Dad said. That goes without saying at this point. The anthropologist giggled again and leaned her head against my father's crotch, facing the ceiling as she continued speaking. This experiment the two bills set out to perform originated from the desire to determine how far away flies could smell death. Were the same insects returning every day to feed on these bodies? That was the question. So what did they do, Mr. Max? Utilizing a net, they captured several specimens from a decomposing body, transported them several miles away, marked the thorax of each fly with orange paint, then released them to the wild. The next day, the bills returned to the body, and what did they find? Flies hovering over the corpse. Not just any flies, but flies with orange paint. They came back for the body. Despite the odds, they found it again. And if that isn't the most romantic thing you've ever heard in your life, then I'm sorry. I'm afraid you do not have a heart. You know, the anthropologist said, smacking her lips and studying the near-empty bottle of liquor in her hands. There's over 20,000 cemeteries in this country of yours. 20,000! And those are just the official ones. The ones documented and reported. Of course, there are others. Consider the Civil War. Consider Native Americans. Since humans set foot on the earth, we've been burying ourselves beneath it. We are given a finite amount of space and we have tried our hardest to fill it as quickly as possible. Do you know how many people have ever lived in all of history? If she was directing these questions towards us, she wasn't waiting for a response. A little over 100 billion. Presently, there are maybe 8 billion people alive, which tells us what? That there's 14 or so dead people to every one person still living. We are surrounded by the dead, Mr. Max and Mr. Dillon, and their numbers only grow larger every day. Do you think we will always have the room to bury them?
to bury you or me? The planet's capacities are limited. Soon there will be no spaces available for anyone, and then what? What will we do with our dead? Cremation? Always a choice. A wasteful choice, but a choice. Except most modern cowardly religions explicitly forbid desecration of the body. Will they cave in and allow it, risking exile from their fantastical holy lands? You have any idea what those ashes are, Mr. Max and Mr. Dillon? The ones family members carry around in prized urns because they aren't ashes, at least not in the sense that most people understand the definition of the word. No, what's in those urns is, it's your skeleton. It's your crushed bone fragments, the bits that never disappear. Because try as we might, as a human race, we are here to stay. As bone fragments, as memories, as destroyers of nature, we are here forever. Her lips started trembling, and I thought for a second she was about to cry. Then she wiped her face and took another drink and refused to make eye contact with any of us. Some countries have already started embracing grave rentals, meaning loved ones pay an ongoing lease for a certain amount of time, and when the lease expires, you're dug back up and flung in the trash to make room for the next corpse eager to rot in an overpriced box. Meanwhile, science facilities all over the planet are in desperate need of new donations to continue their studies. And do you know what it costs the donors? Absolutely nothing. Compare that to a coffin, which averages between two and five thousand dollars and does not include the cost of the funeral itself, which can add another five to seven thousand. The average cost of a funeral in the United States is nine thousand dollars. Nine thousand. Do you think cremation is any more affordable? It certainly isn't as expensive as a standard burial, but if you think it's cheap, you have another thing coming. Cremations average between four and seven thousand. In Texas, minimum wage is seven dollars and twenty-five cents, meaning someone working forty hours a week with a minimum wage job can have at the most expect to bring in fifteen thousand dollars in one year, and that's before the government decides to gleefully drain you further into poverty by collecting taxes. Not from the wealthy, mind you. Do you think Bezos pays taxes? Are any of these billionaire savages who can afford to be buried on the moon? No. They come for you because they know you don't have any other choice. So, Mr. Max and Mr. Dillon, let me ask you this. In this country, in this lifetime, can you or anyone else really truly afford to die? Is that a luxury we have at this point? Candy returned over two hours later. It's about time, Miss Candace, Dr. Winsenreed said when her assistant walked through the door. I was beginning to fear you had abandoned your employment. I'm sorry, Dr. Winsenreed, Candace said, dragging in several tote bags full of medical supplies. I-35 is a graveyard this time of day. Everybody coming home from work, especially between New Braunfels and San Marcos, where all the construction is. The anthropologist giggled. We were just discussing graveyards, were we not? She glanced over at us for confirmation, which we refused to offer. Neither of us had said a word to her since her drunken ramblings about burial plots. I think we were too afraid to hear what else she had to say. I think I found everything you wanted, Candy said out of breath. There's a couple more bags out in the trunk I need to get. Are we doing this... this... Procedure tonight, or I fail to see another appropriate time, Miss Candace, do you? It's just that neither of us have eaten dinner yet, and we both had a lot to drink today, so maybe it would be better to wait until tomorrow when we've rested, had a chance to sober up. Nonsense, the anthropologist said. Do you think Vladimir Demikov would have held up science because he knocked back a couple of drinks? In those glorious times, everybody operated drunk off their asses. If anything, I imagine the alcohol only improved his skills as a champion of transplantology. Oh, okay, Candy said, sounding doubtful. If you say so, Dr. Winsenreed. 
I did say so, Miss Candace. If you were listening properly, you would know that's exactly what I said. Yes, ma'am. Now, are we going to change the world forever, or are we going to stand around second-guessing ourselves all night? They decided to conduct the procedure in Dad's bedroom, since a master bed was the next best thing to a surgical table. Plus, by then, the living room had started feeling awfully packed, considering how many bodies both living and dead occupied it. Myself, Dad, Dead Dad, Dead Mom, Candy, Dr. Winsenreed, Comrade, and, of course, you. There was simply no space there to transplant a head onto another body. Dad suggested this might have been a sign not to do the surgery at all, and Dr. Winsenreed responded by laughing louder than any person has ever laughed before. Then she unscrewed the lid from another bottle of liquor candy scavenged from the kitchen. After helping herself to a generous chug, she made a screwed-up face and belched, then nodded down the hall. Let's get started. We were left restrained on the love seat as the two of them ventured down into Dad's bedroom and began reorganize it in the way Dr. Winson Reed envisioned. Once in a while, stepping out to retrieve another bag of supplies they'd set down in the living room. Sometimes we could hear arguing. Sometimes we could hear laughter. Dad and I said nothing as we waited. Time passed. Maybe an hour. They returned to the living room, drenched in sweat. They were ready. I wasn't needed, as it turned out, but you already knew that because you weren't needed either. They only wanted the two dads. Did it feel more ghoulish to create a two-headed boy compared to a two-headed man? I imagine so. If they were busted trying to attach a grown man's head to another grown man... They'd have plenty of concern and questions to answer, but if they were caught attaching a child's head to another child, they'd be shot on sight. Everything was safer with adults. That's why they left us in the living room while they did what they did. You, me, dead mom, and comrade. None of us were invited to witness scientific history being made, which honestly was fine by me. Nothing about the experiment sounded appealing. What kid wanted to see their father in such a state? Okay, maybe lots of kids, but not me. That was the last thing I wanted to lay eyes upon. They took Dead Dad into the bedroom first, since he was the least likely to put up a fight. Dr. Winson Reed took his shoulders and Candy grabbed his ankles. We never did dress him in a t-shirt, and I regretted not arguing for one when we originally brought them into the living room. His chest had caved in, and his stomach had eaten itself. Blackened bone poked out of bits of flesh. The maggots had long abandoned their post, having helped themselves to anything worthy of salvage. I wondered if under my own shirt something similar was going on with my body. Surely the answer was yes. Our decomposition had been a shared experience. A gross, sacrilegious weekend of gonzo simultaneity. Why would our mutual rot suddenly stop? It wouldn't. We'd be together, linked by some unknowable curse until the very end. Next, they came for Dad, who told them to go get fucked. Unfortunately, he was tied up, so there wasn't much he could do to defend himself as they dragged his carcass down the hallway. The last thing I heard him say before they shut the bedroom door was something about the anthropologist being crazy, which I don't think anybody exactly disagreed with, including the anthropologist herself. Someone turned on music in the bedroom, loud and abrupt. It scared not only me, but also Comrade, who jumped from her sleeping spot and started barking at the wall. It took me a second to recognize the song. I hadn't seen The Office in a long time, not since Mom and I binged every season a couple Christmas breaks ago, but it was impossible to forget the show's theme song. And that's exactly what they were blasting in Dad's bedroom as they performed the surgery. It didn't play once either, but continuously, as if edited on a loop. From the living room, I grew sick of the noise within three minutes, but at least I was lucky enough to have the rest of the house to muffle it a bit. 
In the bedroom, however, I imagine the song was pure torture. Turn it off! I heard Dad scream after so long. Please, God, turn it off! But I didn't know if he was talking about the office theme song or the sudden machinery noises that had also announced themselves down the hallway. Both sounded equally terrifying. We didn't have any clocks in the living room. There used to be this nice antique grandfather clock across from the television, but Mom took that with her in the divorce. Dad didn't care. What use did he have with time? He could check his cell phone if he got desperate, like a normal person. That's what he told me when I asked him about it, whenever that had been, soon after the divorce, I guess. So, realistically, I had no way to track how much time passed during the surgery. Well, not a traditional method, because, to be fair, I did have the theme song from the office plan nonstop, over and over, and that theme song is at most 30 seconds long, meaning every 30 seconds the music would die down, offering this false sense of hope that maybe, just maybe, it was finally over, only for the pianos to come bursting through the speakers again to insert a knife into my ear and twist, only to pause every 30 seconds and start pulling it out, then suddenly jam it back in. Sometimes, I blissfully forgot it was playing, but the amnesia didn't last for long. The specific notes of the song are too jarring to simply tune out for any extended length of time. Nothing about it is relaxing. It's the kind of song that feels like it's aware of the pain it's causing, and it's reveling in the agony of it all. I wanted to kill it. I wanted to reach through time and prevent the office from ever airing. I wanted to do this more than anything else, more than fixing our decomposition issue, more than trying to save mom. I wanted to murder the office. I wanted to erase it from existence. I wanted it gone forever. Comrade never calmed down either. She despised the music as much as I did, running up and down the hallway, growling and barking. If the song had been a person, she would have ripped its throat out. Instead, she was left with no other choice but to bask in frustration. They were in the bedroom for a little over 400 The Office theme songs, which I think translated to about three hours. Office math is difficult. They don't teach that in school. And to be clear, they shouldn't. Nobody should practice office math unless they're stuck in a similar situation as I was. Then, I suppose it does come in handy, but still, avoid it if possible. The bedroom door opened and Candy came down the hallway, looking utterly exhausted. She sat on the love seat next to me and leaned her head back. Comrade ran over for some attention, but the assistant was too tired to offer any. The anthropologist remained in the bedroom but I couldn't hear what she was doing over the sound of the office theme song. Did it work? I asked, unable to decide what I wanted the answer to be. <laughs> of course it didn't work, Candy whispered. It was never going to. She yawned and glanced down the hallway. It was empty. She's lost her fucking mind. Wh why are you guys listening to that song over and over? She gave me a look like, why do you think, and said nothing more about it. Then she turned and untied me. There's no reason for you to be like that. You're just a kid. Thank you. Are you going to run away? I shrugged. I don't think so. I studied the rotten stump of my left arm. It had turned black. I don't know where I'd go. To the police, maybe? Dad said no police. Your dad murdered my boyfriend. He didn't mean to. Are you sure about that? Then, from the bedroom, the office theme song shut off and the anthropologist screamed, It's alive! Candy and I hurried down the hallway with Comrade in quick pursuit behind us. On the floor next to the bed was dead dad, except now his head was missing. The other dad, my dad, was sitting up on the mattress looking dazed. Behind him, 
At the top of his shoulders, attached to his spine, was the second head. It hung sideways, with his eyes facing the ceiling. His eyes, which were open, yes, but also looking around. And his mouth was opening and closing, trying to talk, but only succeeding in making strange, wet animal noises. And Dad, my dad, trembling and saying over and over, What? 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 Meanwhile, Dr. Winsenreed stood in front of the bed, eyes darkened with exhaustion and lunacy, grinning wide enough to devour a village. I did it, she shouted. I did it! I did it! I did it! Comrade squeezed between me and Candy, took one look at the two-headed dad, then let out a loud whine and fled the way she'd come. As it turned out, she was the only smart one. The second head, the one attached to dad's spine, reminded me of a fish discarded on dry land, gasping for breath, He didn't know how to accept. The mouth kept opening and closing in wide, drawn-out gasps. He was wheezing, like he still had lungs, which couldn't be true, right? Because he was just a head, a head attached to the back of my father. Oh, my God, Candy said. How, how, how did, how is it? Dad, I said. Dad, are you okay? I can feel it, he said. He hadn't looked this afraid since we first found you guys in the garden. I can feel it trying to talk. The mouth is moving. No, he said. That's not what I mean. Tell us, the anthropologist said. Tell us everything you're feeling. Like a bad thought, he said. Like a thought you don't want to have, but it it keeps trying to break through. Like an impulse. Like an urge. What is this? What is this? What did you do? What is the thought saying, Mr. Max? It's saying everything. It's saying everything. What does that mean? Candy said. Dad, what do you want me to do? I asked. Whatever happens, he said, finally looking at me. Don't let them do this to you. Whatever this is, don't let them do it. Don't be silly, Dr. Wizenreed said. I would never. Oh, God, oh, shit, oh, fuck, Dad screamed. I thought we couldn't feel pain anymore. I thought we couldn't. Shut up, another voice said from behind him, the head dangling from the top of his shoulders, surgically attached to his spinal cord, and who knew what else? Please, shut up. The voice sounded like gravel. It's talking, Candy shouted. Holy shit, it's talking. We had spent so much time digging y'all up from your garden grave, trying to get you to talk or give some kind of indication that you were conscious or aware of what was happening. Anything to debunk the increasingly probable theory that the three of you were simply strange bags of insentient meat. That we never stopped and wondered if the idea of you guys talking was a good idea in the first place. Because if you talked, that implied you had something to say. And what could someone in a situation like yours or dead dad's possibly have to say? Nothing uplifting. Nothing optimistic. Nothing good. Talk, 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 the second head said, pupils rolling around the room as dad trembled in the bed. You talk and talk and talk. Nothing productive. Sounds. Voices. Soak it up. Soak it up. Soak it. Hello, the anthropologist said, leaning over the mattress and meeting the second head face to face. My name is Dr. Winsenreed. It's a pleasure to... We know who you are. We know what you are, the second head said, then spit a glob of something black into her face. She nearly fell down as she scrambled away, using the collar of her white jacket to clean the saliva-like substance from her cheek. We know who all of you are. Listening, listening, talk, listening, talk, listening. Who are you? Dad asked in a pain scream. Who the fuck are you? No, Second Head said. That mouth, that mouth, no, speak. How is this? Dad started to say, then stopped 
and choked on something thick and wet sounding. His own head sagged down, but the rest of his body remained active, still on the bed but fidgety, squirmy. The second head had taken control. There, he said. Isn't that better? What did you do to my dad? I asked, somehow the only one capable of speaking. Everybody else was either incapacitated or too shocked to say anything. Is he alive? The second head tried to laugh, but he ended up sounding like a failing car engine. Is that what you ask? Black spit sprayed from his mouth as he pronounced the last word. Everybody in the room flinched, which only seemed to amuse the head. Are you an alien? Candy asked loud and sudden. Alien to what? To you? Maybe you are alien to us. Dr. Winsenreed stepped closer to the bed. Confidence returned. Do you know what you are? Do you have any idea what's happening here? The second head smacked his disgusting lips. Black spit trickled down his cheeks. Then, as if he'd already forgotten what the anthropologist asked, the head said, Earlier, you were talking the differences. Humans, animals, not see. You don't see the one true separation. And what would that be, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Head? Dad crawled forward to the edge of his bed. His own head was limp, but the second head attached to his spine was active and drooling, like it was piloting my father's body. Humans, only creatures on planet, understand one day they die, he whispered to the anthropologist, and nothing in this world or other that can stop it. Then, without waiting for a response, Dad's body sprung forward, and the head attached to his spine opened his jaws and sunk his teeth into Dr. Winston Reed's face. When he jerked back, he kept his mouth clenched shut, tearing off a chunk of her flesh, revealing pulsating red tissue plastered over the front of her skull, nerves and veins and everything else nobody's ever supposed to see. But there it was, almost like she was wearing a Halloween mask. I'd never seen eyeballs so white before. They glowed against the contrast of her face's sudden redness, like white cue balls submerged into a lasagna. Hey, now, the anthropologist managed to mutter before collapsing to the floor. Candy was the first and only one to scream, maybe because none of the rest of us in the room were still alive. Fear seemed to impact the dead differently than the living. It was harder to surprise us. And when such an emotion did strike, the physical act of expressing it with appearance or sound often did not feel worth the effort. Meaning, while Candy screamed and ran down the hallway, I simply stood next to the door, silent, watching. The anthropologist twitched on the floor a couple times before going motionless. Her impossibly white eyes remained wide open. The front of her exposed skull cried red. The lab coat she'd been wearing since we met her had lost its impeccable cleanliness. On the bed, the second head gnawed on Dr. Winsenreed's detached face. It looked like a loose flap of fried chicken skin dangling from his lips, but he never swallowed, because he couldn't. He could only chew and prepare it for someone else, someone like my father. When the second head spit the mangled face onto the bed, Dad jolted awake again. He looked around, confused, mumbling something unintelligible before focusing on the pile of soggy skin beneath him. Eat, the second head whispered. Eat it. Without hesitating, Dad leaned down and pushed his eager mouth into the wet, sloppy mess and started feasting swallowing the anthropologist's face bit by bit. The second head attached to my father's spine moaned in bliss with each helping. Yes, he shouted, more, more, more. After the face was gone, the dad creature crawled off the bed and began working his way through the rest of Dr. Winsenreed. I could only watch them go at it for so long before leaving the bedroom. This wasn't my father. This was something else. 
if our bodies had been going through a transformation, then this was the final form. Something about combining the two bodies, the alive version and the dead version, that was the key in completing whatever bizarre atrocity we were experiencing. Maybe that was my dad's body in there, but it was no longer my dad. It was something different. Something, something, what exactly? Uh, something bad. Something real bad. I found Candy in the kitchen, going through our drawers and collecting as many knives as she could find. Comrade followed her every movement, perhaps hopeful she would get another helping of canned chili. What are you doing here? I asked. The sound of my voice prompted Candy to scream again. She spun around and dropped several knives. Comrade hopped away as the blades scattered along the linoleum floor. Get away from me, she shouted, face smeared with tears and snot. She waved the only knife she'd managed not to drop. You should leave, I said and meant it. I did not fear for myself. The idea of being in danger at this point felt laughable. But Candy? She had things to lose. She wasn't safe here. This wasn't a house for the living anymore. I can't! She's already dead, I told her, thinking she was afraid to abandon her boss. My keys! My phone! She gestured the knife toward the hallway. Oh, I said. Uh, maybe you should just run. Where am I going to go? Anywhere away from here. But it was too late. Loud, frantic movement crescendo down the hallway. The dad creature on all fours burst into the kitchen with the bottom head, my father, licking leftover globs of gore from his lips. The top head, imposter, drooled black sludge and moaned, Hungry! So hungry! Candy let out another scream and dropped the last knife. You! The second head said, You! I'm sorry! Candy cried out. He wasn't me! I didn't do anything! You help us. Help? Come. The dad creature crawled out into the living room, leaving me and Candy alone in the kitchen. Comrade was nowhere in sight, hiding somewhere. What can I do? Candy asked me. I think it wants you to follow it. But why? I don't know. In the living room, we found the dad creature crouched next to the couch, studying dead mom in her wedding dress. Both of the heads were given their complete devotion to her presence, like they were worshipping her at an altar. The scene looked oddly sad. Her too, the second head whispered. Fix her too. Fix? Candy said, shaking her head. What do you mean? Like you did us, the dad creature told her. Fix her like you fixed us. Candy backed away until she walked into a wall. I, I can't. I'm not. I don't know how. The dad creature spun around and caught her trying to flee. The bottom head growled while the top head screamed. Fix our bride or we will take your face. Crying again, she pointed down the hallway. You killed her. She knew how to do this, not me. You know enough. With each word, the dad creature crawled closer. We need our bride. We need her. I don't know where she is. The top of the head was so close to Candy's mouth, he could have kissed her if he wanted to. Corpus, he whispered. Corpus Christi. Thank you.
Live spooky, die spooky. <laughs> Rest in peace, Max. <laughs> <laughs>